Hello, Yay Series. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, uh, letting me talk to you. Uh, could you begin to say a few words about yourself? Sure, thanks for the interview. My name is JC Reese and I work for Animal Charity Evaluators. We're a group at the intersection of the effective altruism and animal advocacy movement. So we apply the principles of effective altruism, which is using uh, data and evidence and reason and arguments to figure out how to do the most good. And we figure out how to do that in the context of helping animals. So we have a list of charities that we recommend as our top charities. We also recommend some standout organizations. And then we do other research to help animal advocates and organizations be as impactful as they can. And how do you do that research? Uh, what kind of work is it? Yeah, so it's, it's really tough, especially given the limited evidence we have in the field right now. But for example, we can look at studies that have been done in other areas, areas like health behavior change or uh, political advocacy, where they have done uh, you know, rigorous scientific studies to figure out what works, we can apply that to helping animals. We can also look at what's worked in the animal advocacy movement so far, you know, which campaigns have been successful, which campaigns haven't. Um, and finally, we can look at history and see for other movements, especially the ones that are more similar to helping animals, see what worked, what didn't, and try to do, do more of the stuff that works. Mm. So, <clears throat> effective altruism, uh, it's about doing the best you can mm -hmm. for other uh, beings. Uh, human and animals. So, if you want to do this, what, which area is best to focus on? Human poverty or global poverty? Uh, the environment maybe? Or animals? What would you say? Yeah, so I started off just having the broad goal of doing the most good. I saw so many issues in the world that I wanted to help with. Mm. There was climate change, there was global poverty, there was medical issues like cancer that were I felt personally connected to. But I knew that my ultimate goal was just to help others as much as I could as possible. Um, so I was investigating this, I was thinking about it, there was this whole community trying to solve this problem um, and ultimately I decided that I wanted to help animals, particularly focus on farmed animals. Um, and the arguments are pretty simple, you know, there are so many of them, um, they're suffering so greatly, um, not many people are working to help them, so you can have a really big impact by being one of the first. Mm -hmm. And finally, you can do a lot of good. There are ways to make a big difference. You can help um, companies change their policies to give them uh, larger cages that increase their welfare. You can inspire people to go vegetarian and vegan. Um, there are all these things you can do, and ultimately you can put in a very small amount of effort and do huge amounts of good. And that cost effectiveness is ultimately what really appeals to me mm -hmm. and why I focus on helping animals. You began to touch on that, um, but what, what are the most effective methods you can use for helping animals? What yeah. have you found so far? So among them are those corporate campaigns. This is working with a company to help them either have more vegetarian and vegan options or to um, have higher welfare standards for their animals. And basically you can put a small amount into campaigning into persuading the company to do that. And because the company works with so many animals in their supply chain, it has a really big impact. Um, you can also create what I call triggering events. So these are things in society that inspire people to take action, to change their own diets, to become activists, to um, do all these things to help animals. So this is like an undercover investigation, for example, um, that changes the public uh, outlook on animal welfare and how farmed animals are treated and helps people realize what's going on. Um, and I think that's a really impactful way to help as well. Mm. Could you say more about um, what can psychological research um help us uh, when it comes to what kind of attitudes we have or ways of communicating veganism and animal rights. What have you found to be most effective? Sure, so for example, there's this thing called social messaging, which is just indicating to people that other people are making the changes you want them to make. And we're very social animals, you know, we, we evolved that way. Other creatures, other species are social as well. And we really feel peer pressure very strongly. So if you can tell people that there's a big movement um, behind helping animals, which there is. You can talk about the figures of how many more plant-based alternatives there are than there used to be. You can talk about how many people are adopting vegan and vegetarian diets. Mm -hmm. um, you could even talk about in other areas like um, helping you know, animals used for entertainment with SeaWorld and the documentary Blackfish. And telling people about those changes that are going on helps them feel like uh, they can be part of a community and part of a new movement. And that's very powerful to people mm -hmm. um, to get them to make changes. Okay, great. And then there are actions more of a political nature that has to do with maybe changing the, the whole society mm -hmm. and how we look uh, upon animals. Uh, like for instance, uh, the method of open rescues, if you're familiar with that. Would you say that it's possible to measure those kind of uh, actions or campaigns uh, of the effect they have? 
Yeah, so I think we, we have to do the best we can in terms of measurement. So of course I think we can measure it. Whether we can put it into quantitative estimates, I think that's more challenging, but we could use qualitative perspectives. So for example, looking at those social movements and seeing that um, rescuing people and liberating individuals who were oppressed has been something that many movements have done and, and found to be very successful throughout history. We can also consider you know, the psychological arguments of like, um, does that actually make people think of animal activists as criminals or, or wrongdoers? in which case it might actually harm our cause. And these sort of qualitative arguments, you can put them together and come up with some sort of evaluation. I think it's harder to put that into a quantitative perspective, but you can at least think of it in terms of, should, is this where my resources should go, or should I put them somewhere else? Right. And how big would you say is the risk that we only focus on the methods that are easy to measure and ignore those that are hard or maybe even impossible to measure? Yeah, I think it's a big risk, and I think in other areas of effective altruism, so for example global poverty, um, I think there are good reasons to focus on the things that have strong evidence because lots of studies have been done, you know, lots of studies have been done showing other things didn't work and that a few things did work. Um, so we should focus on the things that have been measured and have been, you know, quantifiably uh, proven or at least shown very strongly to have the most impact. In animal advocacy, however, since we lack that evidence, I think we have to be a lot more open-minded. And we're working on really broad goals, for example. So if we want to make long-term change for animals, we might have to do more than even just changing people's behavior in the short term, which maybe we can measure. Maybe we need to actually change attitudes. We have to make people see across species barriers and see that all of these animals matter. Um, in which case, that might be more difficult to measure, but ultimately more impactful. Mm. And I know you're right now on a tour in Europe and mm -hmm. I guess you have been having presentations in the US as well, mm -hmm. maybe other countries. What kind of reactions uh, do you get from animal rights activists when you talk about effective altruism uh, for the animals? Yeah, so everyone's excited about it in theory. You know, they think effectiveness, of course I want to do more good. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is really applying that. So for example, I love to see organizations and individuals that are taking a hard look at what they're currently doing and are willing to admit that it might be um, not the best thing they could do. And I've talked to some people like that. So the animal rights group here in Sweden, um, I was having discussions with them where we were talking about some of the things they've been doing and what they could do better. And when you have people that are open-minded and willing to change, um, I think that's really promising. But of course, everyone wants to say that what they're doing is effective. So that's really the big difference. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that we're seeing more of the people willing to change their mind in the animal advocacy movement, because that's how we can ultimately have the most impact. Mm -hmm. For some, I think EA seems uh, maybe too theoretical or abstract. Have you found that among animal rights activists? Yeah, so once I give my talk, they don't think that as much because, for example, one of the things I discuss is that um, going out there and trying things and innovating is often the best way to do research. So instead of, you know, armchair theorizing, if we go out and, you know, try open rescues, try those corporate campaigns, of course, and see how they work, um, like the best research is often done on the ground. Um, that's what I've done personally, you know, I've participated in rescues, um, I have two hens of my own who I've gotten to interact with and can then share their stories. They've given me a better appreciation of, for example, um, what sort of things matter to hens uh, whenever we're talking about what policies we want to change for corporations and policy uh, and law. Um, we want to know what really matters to those hens. And by actually interacting with them, by going to sanctuaries, by having some in my own home, I'm able to have a better appreciation for what matters to them. Today uh, we find uh, there is so much suffering uh, of animals and also humans. What are your hopes for the future? Are you optimistic that this can change? Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic that the future can change because in so many social movements of the past, we've seen people uh, be very pessimistic and have a lot of status quo bias. They don't think anything will ever happen that's not something that they can imagine in their immediate circumstances. So they don't foresee that, um, you know, gay people might one day have the right to marry. They don't foresee that um, one day all humans will be considered equal. Everyone will be able to vote, for example. Um, but that has, time and time again, uh, proven people wrong. And since we do have those moral arguments on our side, since we do have, you know, technological developments that are helping people make these changes every day towards a more animal-friendly food system, and finally we have the activists, we have the effectiveness-focused, very dedicated group of people that's working to make these changes. Because all these forces are pointing in the same direction, the social, the technological, the activist, um, I'm really optimistic about the future for animal rights. That's great to hear. Thanks for uh, talking to us. JC. Thank you. Yeah. And good luck with your tour. Thanks.